Okay, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. welcome to another episode of the uh, coronavirus AC theory class here at the JTC. Um, last week we talked about um, inductors in parallel. We've done series, we've done parallel. Tonight I want to throw capacitors into this same circuit. I want to do both parallel and series. The book chapter and the way it's set up on Moodle right now as far as the Moodle syllabus is um, we're going to first do a week of series and then a week of parallel. Um, I'm going to throw them both at you tonight because they're really not that different than what we've already done. There's one, one quick change um, in, in as far as how you go about analyzing these circuits and that is how you determine X sub C. So X sub C equals 2 pi frequency times capacitance, but it's 1 over all of that. It's inverse of the 2 pi fly. So if you've got 2 pi fly memorized, remember the L on the 2 pi fly is for inductance. So now we're dealing with capacitors, so we're worried about capacitance. Now capacitors are induct and inductors in a lot of ways are inverts of each other. What a capacitor does in one direction, an inductor does in the other. And we're going to look at that a little bit, especially when we start throwing both of them into a circuit. But for tonight, we're going to work with capacitors. The book does a real good job of explaining what capacitors are. I also have a couple of other videos that I've put up and asked you guys to watch. Watch those videos for the underlying theory of how a capacitor works. Essentially, a capacitor stores a charge and releases a charge when it's appropriate to do so. It is a voltage-sensitive component, unlike an inductor, which is a current-sensitive component. So um, it uh, looks for a voltage to be equalized. When there's enough charge on the capacitor to match the uh, voltage of the source, it just sits there and does nothing. But when there's, there's less charge at the capacitor, the capacitor takes on charge. When there's more charge at the capacitor, then the capacitor gives off charge. So the, the capacitor is pushing and pulling in that way, um, opposite of how an inductor pushes and pulls. So to figure out X sub C in ohms, we go 1 over 2 pi FC. Let's go ahead and do a quick circuit and talk about how that works. We're going to start with series. I'm going to try and do this a little quicker tonight. Obviously, you guys can slow me down, or you can watch me twice, or do whatever you like. But I'm going to go ahead and start with a quick circuit. We're doing series, so I'll throw a resistor in there, because obviously we've got some resistance and a capacitor. Now, uh, let's throw some easy numbers at this guy. I'm going to throw out my 50 ohms, which is my standard. I'm just making this up as I go. I know that when we're dealing with capacitors, because of how this formula works, to get a number that's going to work and be a decent workable number for me, I'm actually going to be in the micro farads. So we're no longer in Henry's, because Henry's inductance. We're in a, a, a unit called farad, my, uh, named for Michael Faraday. And you can read all about Michael Faraday. One of the videos, the, the British woman that does the videos that I put up, talks about Faraday a little bit. We're going to give this guy a value. I'm going to make one up right out of thin air, and I'm going to say uh, uh, 225 uh, microfarads. So a microfarad is going to be a millionth of a farad. So that's the number equals 0 .000225. See, if it was millifarads, it'd be the first three digits past the, the, the decimal. But since it's micro, it's the next three. That's the same as uh, 10 to the negative 6, for those of you that do scientific notation. So 225 microfarads. This is the number I have to dump into that equation. So to make that equation work in my calculator, I'm going to multiply 2 times pi times 60, because if I didn't tell you any different, we're at 60 hertz. Right? We're in America, we're electricians, we deal with 60 hertz. 2 times pi times 60 times 0. 0.000225. I'm going to multiply all that and then I'm going to invert it. I'm going to take 1 over that number. Now, this is a fraction, right? 1 over a number, that's just a fraction. Like 1 fourth is a fraction, 1 fifth is a fraction, 1 seventeenth is a fraction. As that number in the denominator, is that right? I always get numerator and denominator. I'm pretty sure the bottom is the denominator. As that number in the bottom gets bigger, the whole value of the number gets smaller, right? So as this number gets smaller, the whole value gets bigger. So obviously when I multiply something by micro any value, 
I'm going to get a small number. Do you know what else I'm going to do right now before I forget is I'm going to set my timer for half an hour so the video doesn't run out on me. If I can do this, sorry to make you watch me use my phone. But here we go, and clock, and I'm going to set my timer, and I'm going to ring it for uh, how about 26 minutes to start, just so I don't forget and let the video go off again. So, other thing I've got to do is run this number through my calculator. So the way I do this on my calculator, first of all, get the thing running, make sure there's enough light, flow. So I'm going to go 2, and then I'm just going to hit the pi button, and the pi button's right up there, 2 pi 60. Then I'm going to hit multiply. That's the first time I actually had to hit multiply on the, on the uh, calculator. And then I'm going to multiply it by uh, point zero, 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 two, two, five. Enter. That gives me a really ugly, tiny little number. But I'm not done yet. I need to take that number's inverse. So what I do to take its inverse, and you guys already know this function on the calculator, um, using second answer function. On my calculator, I'm going to go, uh, actually, I'm just going to hit x to the negative 1, and it's going to give me answer, x to the negative 1. It takes the invert of the thing that I just did, my last answer. And that equals 11.789. I'm going to call it 11.79. What's my unit? Ohms. 11.79 ohms is what the value of this capacitor is as far as its capacitive reactance. It's X sub C is 11.79 ohms. Now I've just got a voltage divider, right? Um, I got some of the voltage dropped here, some of the voltage dropped here. I better give myself a voltage value here. Let's go ahead and start out with something easy. Uh, we'll say 100 volts. So if I've got 100 volts here, um, I'm going to do some of that's going to drop here and some of that's going to drop here. But just like an inductor, this capacitor's X sub C is 90 degrees to this resistor. It's actually 180 degrees from the inductor. So, so far we've been drawing a triangle like this and we've been saying these are the inductive values. I shouldn't write either, that means current. These are the inductive values, right? And these are the resistive values. I've had current at the inductor and current at the resistor, um, say, in a parallel circuit. I have had voltage at the inductor, voltage at the resistor in a series circuit, right, that we've been doing. And then I've solved hypotenuse on all of those. I've had power, reactive power in VARs at the inductor. I've had true power at the resistor, and I've gone ahead and solved for apparent power. I've had that triangle all the way. Well, guess what? The capacitor's actually down here. The capacitor's still 90 degrees to the resistor, but it's 180 degrees to the inductor. So later we're going to find out these two cancel each other out. We're going to have to work that math. It's one extra step when we've got both a capacitor and an inductor. But guess what? Today we don't. We only have a capacitor in this circuit. This is a RC circuit, not radio controlled. It is resistive capacitive circuit uh, with AC currents on it. So 11.79, 50 ohms. Let's go ahead and do my triangle here. Uh, just because I just told you it was like that, I'm going to go ahead and draw my triangle like this today. Just so I remember that I've got R and I've got C. And my resistance is 50 ohms and my capacitive, my capacitive reactance is 11.79 ohms. So I have to run that through that Pythagorean, remember, because I am solving this hypotenuse. What I'm really solving, what most of you understand, is I'm solving this resultant vector. But I'm solving it by solving the hypotenuse because a rectangle has equal uh, diagonals. So I need to take, I'm going to say that my z, because that's what I'm solving for, impedance, equals the square root of 11.79 squared plus 50 squared. And I could have put those in either order, right? Could have put r first and then x sub c, it doesn't matter. But I need to take this thing, that this guy's square. And multiply it by itself, and then take this guy and multiply it by itself, by itself, and add them together. And then I need to take the square root of both of them. Some of you have been missing one or two of the steps on that. Some people haven't been actually taking the square root. Some of you have only been squaring one of these two numbers. We need to square both of these two numbers, and then the resultant sum of the two squares, its square root is our hypotenuse. Okay, so calculator time again. 
Let's see here. Uh, 11.79 squared plus 50 squared equals, boom, I just solved this big ugly number underneath and it's 2,639 and change. But I don't even care because I want that number square root. So I'm going to go second square root, making sure I didn't hit the cube root or the multiple root, second answer. Check my screen, yep, it says square root, open parens, answer. That should give me a number that makes sense and it's 51.37. Now, does that make sense? Can I imagine a triangle, a real honest-to-goodness triangle that lives on a plane, planar geometry, right, Eu Euclidean geometry is what this is part of, that has one side that's 50, the other side that's almost 12, and the hypotenuse is 51. Yes, I can imagine that triangle. So if I went one, two, three, four, five lengths, and one in a little bit of length, the, this is actually closer to what that shape would be, right? If this was 50 and this was almost 12, you can see the hypotenuse on this triangle is going to be only a little bit bigger than this longer sign because this guy is so short. So that number makes sense to me. It also follows the golden rule of it is bigger than either one of these two, but not bigger than the two of them put together, which has to be. You never have a right triangle that doesn't work that way. So I have solved for my z impedance. So let's put that over here. z equals, since this is a series circuit, that's the thing I have to do first, equals 51.37 what? I didn't put any unit over here. In class, if I had live people in this classroom and not just a camera I was looking at, I would expect somebody to say, hey, unit, don't forget your unit, because the units are imperative. Do it again over here. Put my unit up over there. So call me on that right through the video. You can yell at the screen. Nobody cares. Uh, I've solved my Z. I'm going to use my Z to solve my current because this is a series circuit. Same thing as we've been doing since day one. Series circuit. I want to solve my current and use that current individually because the current is the same everywhere. It's my baseline for this circuit. Uh, so let's go ahead and solve my current. Uh, let's see, I is current, and if I remember right, we can read this thing, which has been up there for several weeks and nobody's cleaned it off. Uh, it's my magic wheel here. I equals E over Z in this case. Z being, you know, normally R is the way we learned it in Ohm's Law. But I equals the voltage over the total impedance for a series circuit. And I've got 100 volts. And I've got 51.37 ohms. So right off the bat, I can tell you it's just a little bit less than 2 amps. Let's do the math just because. Uh, 100 divided by, and I'll use the number I rounded to rather than the closer number on my calculator, just so you guys are following along at home, you can too. Uh, I get 1.94666 amps. I'm going to go round 1.946 to 1.95 equals 1.95 amps. Those of you who don't know the rules to rounding, you, you round up when it's more than 5 and, and down when it's less than 5. Um, I like when I started out with two whole numbers somewhere. Uh, I started out, I guess, with a whole number uh, over here, 225. I like to just keep it at a couple of decimals. That rule kind of breaks down when I'm dealing with microfarads, though, so never mind. 1.95 works for me. So I've got 1.95 amps. Now, again, series circuit, I can apply that 1.95 amps here and the same 1.95 amps here. Now, here's a thing that, that people who are uh, sticklers and or physicists or both will tell you is that I don't actually have 1.95 amps going through that capacitor. The current doesn't actually go through the capacitor. We talk about it going around the capacitor, but that's not actually even happening either. What's happening is, is current is building up on this plate of the capacitor, current. Charge is building up on this plate of the capacitor when the voltage is up, part of that sine wave. When the voltage goes back down, this is my zero, then it starts releasing charge off of that and charge is building up on the other side. So it's kind of like a tank that empties and fills, empties and fills. It's these two parallel tanks, one's filling the other constantly. Or I've even seen some people relate it to like a slinky. You, know, you got a slinky in hand and one side's filling up as the other is unfilling. And it has to do with where the voltage is compared to the source. Because this guy will continue to charge as long as this voltage is more than this. In fact, it's going to be this voltage. 
whereas this guy will give off charge when this voltage is more than this. When this voltage is less, same thing. Charge is going back and forth. We like to think of it and model it. Remember, model is the way we see the world, and it's a useful thing, even though it's not true. But we like to model it as the current going through the capacitor. Think of it in that way for your, your head to get around it, and it's easier to think of. Okay, current's going through that capacitor. Because 60 hertz, things happen 16 every 16 milliseconds, 60 times a second. It's happening pretty quickly. That capacitor is charging and discharging, and it's as though the current was flowing through that capacitor. At any given time, up to this point and this point, I do have 1.95 amps of current flowing everywhere in the circuit. So 1.95 amps um, of current. And again, that's an RMS value. So maybe it's not correct to say at any given instantaneous time in this circuit. But as this circuit goes, I can model the current as having this line would be 1.95 amps RMS, right? Now, at this split second in time right here, because remember, this axis is time, this being t equals zero, or right now, this 16 milliseconds from now, if I take a split second of time somewhere, sure, my current is not 1.95 amps RMS there. My current is zero right here, and my current is something else less than 1.95. It's only here and here that's 1.95. We call that that happening 60 times a second, 1.95 amps RMS. And that's what's happening everywhere on this circuit. Hope that helped more than confused. So I've got that 1.95 amps. I'm going to go ahead and use that number everywhere. So I know that my voltage by Ohm's law equals E equals I times R, right? And up there it's going to be E equals I times R. Down here it's going to be E equals I put my equal sign, equals I times X sub C, isn't it? Because that's what my own value is at the capacitor. So let's go ahead and dump those numbers into here. Remember, when I'm doing this, when I'm taking that common value, which in this case is current, I have to multiply it individually by each of these things. And later when I go to get power, I have to go and I can take my current at each of them, but I have to use the individual voltages that I've solved for to get power. But that's getting ahead of myself. 1.9 to 5 times 50. Blah, blah, blah. 1.95. I said this was going to be a short one today, and I'm going to try and stick to it. Times 50 equals 97.5 volts. Did I do that right? Well, let's try it. 1.95 amps times 50. Clear. And then over here, I've got my 1.95 amps times... What was it? 11.79. I've lost my own numbers. 11.79. At least I didn't completely freeze like I did last week. So I get 1.95 amps times 11.79 ohms. I get 22.9905. Oh, I'm going to call that 23. So I'm going to say I have 23 volts at the inductor. And I'm going to say I have... Uh, uh, 97.5 volts at the resistor. So let's check that and make sure that my Pythagorean relationship works. Now we already did it there, but let's go ahead and do it again. Now remember, I'm going to draw my triangle like this. It really doesn't matter how you draw your triangle, but I'm doing it that way to, to remind me and you that we're no longer in inductors, we're in capacitors. So my voltage at the capacitor is 23 volts. My voltage at the inductor is 97.5 volts. What is my hypotenuse likely to be? Well, hopefully it's something close to 100, plus or minus a, a, a rounding error, right? So let's say 23 squared plus 97.5 squared. I'm just doing this formula, but I'm using these numbers rather than drawing more stuff on the board. And I've done that. I've done everything inside the radical. That's what this guy's called, is the radical, right, with these numbers. 23 squared plus 97.5 squared. Yeah, get on with it, Jack, you're probably saying. Equals some ungodly number. Looks like 100,000 or 10,000. Let's see what the square root of 10,000 is. Hmm, let's see. Second square root. Uh, I can never find the square root button on this. It's because I'm holding at bad eyes. Second answer equals... 
100.17. Remember, these are volts. So that justifies this. The 0.17 is my rounding error. I remember I rounded pretty well to get to this. I rounded a little bit to get to there. I rounded in a few places. But that is uh, legitimate. So I'm going to erase that now that I've proven that. And I want to make sure I just have the important numbers up here. I'm going to erase this. You guys saw that all, right? I'm going to say uh, my Z, my X sub L is 11.79. I'm going to leave that formula up there because that's really important. But now I'm going to go ahead and we're going to get to powers. And this is a place that more people screwed up on the, on the quiz last time. Now, you were doing it with an inductor, but it's the exact same thing we're doing right now. So power reactive, which I like to just say P, P, P sub R, P with a smaller R. Now, in my texts, in my emails, in my comments on the Moodle, I can't, I can't make those. And I, can, I can't even find the carrots, which are that little symbol to raise or, or drop something too far. I know some of you have emailed and texted me, and you know the math, and you know to use the carrots to say, raising something to the power, use that little carrot symbol. I don't know why they call it a carrot. It looks like that, right? Anyways, we're not going there today. P reactive, or PR, is going to equal uh, everything going on at the reactive element in this one. And the reactive element is the capacitor. So P equals I times E. So my current at the capacitor is my 1.95 amps, right? That's my baseline. That's the same everywhere in this series circuit. And I'm going to multiply that by the volts that we solved for at the inductive, excuse me, at the capacitor, at the reactive element of this, is 23 volts. So 1.95 times 23 volts, 1.95 times 23 equals 44.85. What's my unit? Well, it's reactive power, so my unit is VARS. You can do VAR or VARS, I don't care. But it's not VA, and it's definitely not watts. Okay? If it was watts, it's releasing heat. If it's VA, it's everything. It's the watts and the reactive with their Pythagorean relationship, and that's how I size my wire. That's what the, the circuit sees, the actual source sees. But for this, we want to make sure and use that correct unit, because that tells me that's the reactive power. That's the power that's going out to pulse this thing, and it's going to put it back into the circuit when it discharges. Okay, now let's solve my power true, because that's the only other thing I can solve right now, right? My true power is the heat dissipated, dissipated through that resistor. How much time do I got? My phone killed, died. Eight minutes. We can do this, kids. Uh, power true, 1.95 amps times my voltage, not my resistance. I think that's the mistake I made on the practice. Marcus, uh, Marcus, uh, name of the guitar, I can't think of your last name right now. Marcus Gibson was the one that pointed that out to me, so thank you for that. A couple of you noticed I had a problem, but Marcus actually figured out what I did wrong. Anyways, 1.95 times 97.5 equals, because that's my voltage at the resistor that we already solved, clear 1.95 times 97.5, and that equals 190.125. I'm going to just call that 0.13. I'm going to make a big round there. 0.13 watts. That is my power at the resistor. Now, to solve my power apparent, which is the hypotenuse, I'm going to take the square root of. I'm not going to draw the triangle for this one because I think you guys get it already. I'm going to take the square root of these two things, for the squares of these two things. 44.85 squared plus 190.13 squared. So I've taken the square of the watts and I've taken the square of the bars, I've, I've added them together and I'm going to take their square root. Let's see what the calculator says. 44.85 squared plus 190.13 squared equals, now that's the number under the radical. I still have to work its square root. And the number I get is 38,160 and change. And so I'm going to go second square root, 
second answer. Enter. I keep the lights off down here in front because it makes the screen more readable for the camera, and the lights are on the main and the rest of the room, um, and so I can't read worth a darn. Uh, and I get 195.34. 195.34 VA. Now, does that make sense? Yeah, actually it does. Because again, if I had a triangle with one side of 190 and the other side was only 44, then the, the hypotenuse is going to be longer, but not much longer than this guy. Because 190 is what? Four and a half times the size, or four and a quarter times the size of 44.85. So the hypotenuse is only going to be a little bit longer. Again, it's that triangle we were talking about. One long side, one short side. The hypotenuse ends up being pretty stinking close to the length of the long side. Plus a little bit. So 195.34 VA. Now, power factor. Power factor is just a ratio. It's the ratio of the watts to the VA. The ratio of the true power to the apparent power. And that is to say, how much of what I'm paying for, apparent power, am I actually using up and throwing away? Watts, right? So the power factor formula equals uh, power true over power apparent, or watts over VA if you want to use the units. This is actually the correct formula. This is just a cheat to remind you what the units are. And in this case, it's going to be uh, 190.13 divided by 195.34. That's going to be pretty, pretty stinking close to 90, isn't it, or 95? It's going to be, it's going to be a nice big tall number. Uh, clear. Let's see. 190 divided by 195.34 equals 97.27. I get 97.266, which I'm going to call uh, 0.9727 or 97.27%. So my, of the power I'm using, I'm paying for, which is the apparent power, I'm using up 97% of it. So my power factor is good. This is a, a quote unquote good power factor. If your power factor is less than 85, down in the 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, it's terrible. And the power company will be talking to you. But our power factor is pretty stinking good. It's 97.27. So let's go ahead and figure out what that angle theta is. Now, remember the units on this is power factor is either just a decimal with no unit, or if you want to change it in percents, it's that. Either one of those is acceptable, but you have to remember that when I go negative 1 cos, open parens on my calculator, remember, I'm just pulling that straight off of the calculator, right? It's second cosine, so it's actually cos negative 1 is the correct cos negative 1. Either way, it's the invert cosine. Again, we could go into trade and talk about what that means. But let's dump it into our calculator. What it's giving us is it's giving us the angle between the hypotenuse and the apparent uh, and the uh, true power. So it's that angle because that's the angle that, that is the same as the lead and the lag when we put it in our sine wave. So cos negative 1 of uh, 0.9727 equals 13.418. 13.418. Now remember that triangle that I've been drawing? And I keep saying it looks like this and the hypotenuse is really long? That's because I've got a very small angle here. Angles can be anywhere between 0 and 90, right? Well, for, a, for this, for a triangle, for one side of a triangle, 90 is the biggest an angle can be, right? In fact, it'd be tough to have a second 90 degree angle on this. But 13.418 is a very small angle, and that's this angle theta is 13.418 degrees degrees being the unit for an angle. And we just call it angle theta because somebody decided to call it that. Greek letter theta, I don't even know why. Uh, extra credit, somebody tell me why it's called angle theta. Um, I'm going to erase this, and we're going to draw our sine wave, and we've got a minute 54 to do it, except, of course, the lights go out. <laughs>